It's a shame. Good evening here in Mumbai. It's late evening eight now for you. Yeah, it's eight o'clock. Eight o'clock, eight p.m. It's not bad. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good to see you again. Good to see you too. Thank you. Thank you. Kasadi, are you there? No, Vlado, Kasadi, I can't see Kasadi. Oh, yes, he is there. He is just beside oh, you. Yes, yes. On yes, my sir. screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. He is, uh, his phone is, I mean, his microphone and uh, video is off. Off, right. Should he have the same conditions like you, he wouldn't be seen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're terrible. <laughs> Kazadi, where is he? <clears throat> Not there. Well, I, I'll take a little break before we start. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh my God. Hey, hey, Lewis. Lewis, you there? Lewis Borba. Oh my God. Hello, how are you? Hey, Lewis, how are you doing? Fine, fine, and you? Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Man, the, the big star of internet education. Oh my God. <laughs> you, you finally took a break, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In August, maybe we stop a little bit. Maybe we'll come back in September. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. yeah. yeah you now deserve they should start a, to work. 
you deserve a break. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you uh, okay. I think yeah, yeah, we're doing great. Uh, Yuha's here and Ipe's here. And hey, Yuha, how you doing? I'm hello, fine. professor. Uh, you, you know Lewis, right? Yeah. Hello, professor. Uh, hello, professor. Yeah. Uh, how are you? Good to see you. Fine, fine. Good, good. Where's Ipe? Uh, where's Ipe? Hey, Ipe is down now. You hello, you. Ipe, you got a power you pack, have... power pack panel. You have, thank you for coming, Luis. Hello, how you are you? Just, Good, you're, thank you. You're starting the show. No, no, no. I'm just here to learn. <laughs> uh, I, how are we going to structure? Pragash, yeah? Yeah, Pragash. I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, Pragash. You are going second. Yeah. Um, Yuha will uh, start the proceedings. He will be. Uh, he will talk, and then after that, uh, Luis, and then you, and then I will only talk about my classification of the carotid. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. Okay. And of so course, what is the subject? What is the subject today? Beg your pardon. What is the subject today? Topics. Supracellular lesions. Supracellular lesions. Yeah. Meningiomas or. Meningiomas, pituitaries, uh, craniopharyngiomas, aneurysms, uh, everything in that anterolateral okay. lateral Take the whole world. Yeah. To take the whole yeah. world. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> hey, Ipe, I'll introduce you and you just run it, okay? Yeah. Yeah. When you pick, pick the screen. Hi, Dr. Sabaya. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hey, Ibrahim. Very good to see you. Uh, nice to see you all. Thank you. Ah, here's Ibrahim Spade uh, from Jordan. Hello, uh, hello. Shabarish is here too. Shabarish, Shabarish. How are you doing? <laughs> Good to see you, Shabarish. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and uh, Good to see you. Good to see you too. And if you have some time uh, at the end, I can show a nice uh, supracellular aneurysm that we did. If you have uh, time. Definitely, definitely. Okay, we got about five minutes. I... Yeah, yeah. You let's get let's start off, uh, John. Let's start off. You want and, to start uh, off now? Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. Okay. Okay, everybody. We'll start. Okay. Ten, nine, eight, seven. Well, you know, I, I've got to I've got to set up. Uh, hey, let me make sure I'm set up on the website. Okay. Hold on. I think. Uh, just give me a second. Yeah, it's set up okay. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Oh, let me make sure I'm not. I always put my camera on myself. Uh, stop. Okay. Okay. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Good morning from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett for Neurosurgical TV. We have uh, a power packed uh, webinar now. Uh, I'll let I, I, Cherry and MD uh, of of uh, Nepal and India run it. Okay, I welcome. It's all yours. Hey, uh, good morning, good night, good evening, whatever it is from for the whole world. Uh, we have a very interesting seminar today. We have a very power packed field uh, here with uh, Louis, Yuha, Vlad, uh, everybody. Um, who are very experienced surgeons, Ibrahim is here, Sabarish, uh, Prakash, all of them are here. So we're going to have an interesting meeting. This is going to be a consensus, you see, I mean, uh, and when you say consensus, it depends on different people's perspectives. So consensus is uh, not the only consensus. It's like religion. It, uh, people say you have only one true God. Every religion says that, but then it, it's different perspectives. So consensus doesn't really mean that, okay, we are going to follow only this. Okay. So uh, we are going to have some, uh, dis I mean, in, I mean, disagreements for sure, but that is how life is. That's what makes life interesting. So let's uh, get on to this. We will have an endoscopic specialist who's going to talk on endoscopic stuff. We've got Luis Boba, who is a master of uh, the skull base open, and uh, he keeps uh, 
liking to fornicate uh, endoscopy for sure. So let's uh, start off with uh, Yuha. He's a guest of honor. He's going to say something. And after that, Louis starts officially. Yuha, the stage is yours. Uh, speaking about supracellular lesions, so my approach has been since 1980s has been lateral supraorbital approach. I have done nearly everything through the lateral supraorbital approach. This is it is very simple approach in 10 minutes. I have the dura open and then I go to the meningiomas or aneurysms there. This is my approach. So it is, there are more complicated approaches. I have not used the orbitochicomatic approach. We made the uh, orbitochicomatic stitch. We have also published a very simple stitch. So taking the, all the dura down to have a better view. And uh, one of the most important things in Helsinki and also here is that uh, we have extremely good neuroanesthesia, so it means that you have a slack brain, so you don't have to make so much skull opening, skull-based surgery for the lesions. This has been the, the idea or basics so long time, so that the, when you open the head, the brain is slack, so the, then it is very easy to do whatever surgery through the simple approach, other supraorbital approach, like I said, in 10 minutes, I have opened the door and, uh, and then I'm there going to the lesion. This is what I want to say. So simple, clean, fast, preserve normal anatomy. This has been my principles. Uh, Yuha, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I have seen your lateral supraorbital approach and uh, how you are taking out uh, uh, these lesions. Uh, it's extremely impressive with all the skull base approaches that we have. One thing I've always understood about your approaches, I mean, I have seen, uh, I've also seen operative videos of Yasidil doing the same thing. Uh, primarily, uh, he used to open the Sylvian fissure, but you, I have seen... Uh, you 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 are you, you are onto the lesion very fast, and then you keep decompressing the tumor and taking out the tumor. And that it's uh, at the end of the surgery, there's a lot of beautiful space. I've seen this. I mean, of course, uh, um, it's extremely impressive. Uh, but I'm sure not everybody can do that. It's not not an easy thing to do because to go in with such little space in the beginning and believe that you can take out such a huge tumor out. It's, it's not easy for everybody, but uh, your experience uh, is just huge. And I don't think uh, very many people on this planet can come to the level of experience that you have right now. So uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind words. Like I say, told, so the clue is here that you have extremely good neuroanesthesia. You are a team in the operation room. Neuroanesthesia is the background and they are taking care of the slack brain. And then it is easy to go to the lesion directly without a long time opening of the Sylvian fissure. This is neuroanesthesia. So uh, I appreciate very much their work. I remember when I was uh, operating in Latin America and then I once asked about the blood pressure. So the anesthesia said, Take care of your things. I will take care of mine. So this is wrong attitude. This is wrong attitude. We are a team taking care of the lesions and we the patient is the most important person in the operation room. So we should all concentrate on the patient, not on that kind of uh, how, how to, who is doing what. This is our goal to take care of the patient and this is extremely important. So you should be a team and uh, I'm very grateful to Helsinki Neuroanesthesis. They were so fast and uh, producing slack brain and changing the patient. So you should you could even have not the possibility to go to eat or, or restroom. And they changed already the patient that was cannulated and then uh, had a slack brain. Somehow they had uh, tricks. I don't know exactly what they were. One was 
was intravenous anesthesia with propofol, then uh, manitol in the beginning of the operations. But the first thing what the visitors, in, said, visitors said in Helsinki was, how can the brain be so slack? And it was really always slack, even in the fresh subarachnoid hemorrhage so, and even with hematoma. So it was easy to operate on. And that's why I needed not so much skull brace approaches. So this is my message. Good neuroanesthesia is the clue for good surgery. Excellent. Good evening, Dr. Yuha. Good evening. Good evening, Ayub, sir. Good evening. Good evening. You know, good, evening. So good to have you, man. So good to have you. <laughs> Thank here. you, sir. No, actually, just now my neighbor collapsed. I think he's COVID suspect, but I had to go and help help him out. That's why I got late. Suddenly okay. he had a bradycardia, all these things, but and they called me, so I went down. Sorry for being late. No, that is very important. That is much more important than this for sure. So yeah. So you were a good Samaritan. Now I'm asking uh Vlad is here. Vlad is around. Yeah, I am. Glado. Don't hear you. <coughs> You're around. Yeah. Well, you are, it's, uh, it's not like only anesthesia. You get the slack brain. It's a lumbar drain in which I believe. You know, in all. I'm, all not, I have, I'm using, using lumbar drain only in posterior fossa aneurysms. Never in other Never ever. I use it in all. Never in other cases. Never in, in other all cases. cases. It really, really helps. Simple maneuver. Yeah. Very simple, very easy, very fast. We, we didn't need that in except basilar tip aneurysms. This is the only only thing yeah. we need. So I, I really, really think that the anesthetist has tricks to produce slack brain. You don't they have do. to work. They do. No doubt about that. But you, you, you can use this as an extra. And then the first uh, thing in my hand is to reach the carotid system to open it to get some extra CSF. I don't need, I didn't need any extra there. The anesthesia was so perfect. So I didn't need any extra. Lam to put the lumbar drain takes some time. Our schedule was hectic. So we did. Yeah, it's only for basilatip aneurysms. Okay, uh, so Luis, do you want to start off now or uh, uh, do you want Prakash, the endoscopy guy, to start off or do you want me to start off with some anatomy? It's up to you, Luis. Uh, uh, let me know if you want to start off because the order is such that it's you, uh, Prakash, and then me. So. It's completely up to you guys how how you want to do it. I think Prakash can start, no? Okay. He was okay. Is Prakash, are you ready? Yeah, I can go. I can go. Good to go. Yes, please. Hi, Prakash. Hi. Prakash. Hi. Hi. Hi, another video. <laughs> so uh, I think I, I don't know whether you introduce Prakash or not. Prakash, uh, I and Prakash have been working together from 2015, if I, if I believe so. So it's about five years. He's one of the best endoscopic uh, skull-based surgeons probably in India. He does all those carotid drilling. He's a very good chap. Probably you'll find that in his presentation. That's what I can tell about him. I you know, thank uh, you know, it's a very kind words that uh, he's uh, put out for me. Uh, am I audible to everybody? That's the first thing I want to know. Can everybody hear me very clearly? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. yes. And uh, I think uh, I must acknowledge uh, Vinod uh, right away because we've been uh, partners in uh, these endoscopic cases that I will be presenting. And he's been an invaluable addition to uh, the team at Chitra for uh, many of these procedures. So um, I'd like to first uh, start by emphasizing that uh, the endoscopic endonasal approach uh, that I'm talking about for tumors for the supracellular cistern is not at odds with uh, an open transcranial approach. In the Department of Endosurgery at uh, our center, we are adept at using the transcranial approach as well as the transnasal approach for a variety of tumors. And um, in our own, uh, our own philosophy, the endoscopic corridor and the technique is an addition in the armamentarium of the neurosurgeon 
for um, obtaining better results in terms of tumor resection and uh, outcome. So um, the supracellar cistern itself uh, consists Pragash, of... you need to maximize your screen, please. I'm sorry? You need to maximize your screen. I mean, your screen is... Yes, right? that's right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. So the supracellar cistern itself is uh, a set of cisterns, including the chiasmatic, the middle aspect of the uh, sylvian, the carotid cistern, the interpeduncular, the prepontine, and the system of the oculomotor trigone, all of which communicate with each other. And uh, lesions that occur within the supracellular system, including the craniopharyngiomas, the meningiomas, invasive pituitary adenomas, and some of the other tumors that I might present extend from one system to another. And uh, the approach that we'll talk about essentially gives us a wide corridor to access tumors that occur in this uh, region. So from the endonasal perspective, essentially, we're talking about a cistern that lies above the, above the cella and contains the uh, pituitary stalk and then extends into the interpeduncular cistern and can also extend into the third ventricle. So lesions in this particular region uh, often encompass this, uh, this extend from the supracellular to the interpeduncular system, often also entering into the third ventricle. And the surgical strategy that might be adopted includes an extended endoscopic transtuberculum approach where we start with a right-sided vascularized nasoceptral flap based on the sphenopalatine artery, a bilateral posterior ethmoidectomy, and a wide anterior sphenotomy, which is combined with a posterior septectomy. This gives us room for uh, not just observing all the structures that lie on the other side of the sphenoid, but also for manipulation of instruments within the uh, limited space that we have. The bony septations from the sphenoid sinus have to be removed. This allows for not only uh, a much better approach of the dura, but also for providing a flat surface for laying the nasoceptral flap. The bone over the cella is removed to visualize the cavernous sinus and the optic nerves on both sides. And surgical adjuncts, including neuronavigation and carotid Doppler, are extremely useful for completing this approach. So uh, this is what we might see when we start. But what do these structures that we see from the endonasal perspective how do they correspond to the uh, conventionally adopted landmarks that we are all familiar with when we see them from the transcranial perspective? So uh, one of the most important landmarks is this fold of dura that is called the limbus chiasmaticus. The fold of the limbus lies just anterior to the pre-chiasmatic sulcus. And anterior to this limbus is the dura of the planum sphenoidale. So in sequence from anterior to posterior, we have the dura of the planum, the limbus, the anterior intercavernous sinus and the cellar dura. Now, from the uh, cranial perspective, the limbus that has been colored in uh, this green color corresponds to this region, which is just anterior to the tuberculum. The optic canals, which is shaded in yellow, leads on to the chiasm, which lies in this particular region. And anterior to this, we have the planum, which has been shaded in uh, this blue color. So this is the first uh, correlate, the anatomical correlate that we need to process before we proceed. Now, how is this important? Um, see, from the endonasal perspective, when we open this dura over the planum, we expose the gyrus rectus and the medial as the orbitofrontal cortex. This is often unnecessary for tumors of the suprasellular system. So this is an area that we had called the suprachiasmatic area. And the area of interest that we really have is this infrachiasmatic space colored in green. And um, almost always dural exposure or at least dural opening of this particular region suffices 
for exposing tumors that lie in this particular region, tumors which lie beneath and behind the chiasm, like retrochiasmatic craniopharyngiomas or tuberculum cell meningiomas or invasive pituitary adenomas, all of which might extend into this particular space. The uh, bone removal may be widened. However, dural opening certainly should not be unless absolutely indicated because this might only cause prolapse of the frontal lobe into the surgical field, which is often an impediment for adequate surgical dissection. The second important correlate that we must see is this medial aspect of the optic canal that can be seen on both sides. The medial aspect of the optic canal has uh, been defined as what is called the preforaminal segment, which is before the actual true optic foramen. And this is an area into which the uh, meningiomas often infiltrate. And one of the causes for poor surgical outcome is inadequate exploration of this particular region. So these are certain anatomical correlates from the endonasal perspective that we must all be aware of. The second important thing is the identification of the medial osea. Now as a concept, the optic nerve and the carotid artery confluence at this area called the medial osea. And opening the middle OCR gives access not just to the cella and to the supracellar system, but also to the proximal aspect of the optic nerve. Now, the paraclinoid carotid artery that can be seen here is not just very prominent, but also is often bereft of bone, is bare, and is a common um, site for injury that might happen during uh, bone removal in this region. So this is something that one must be aware of and identification of the middle OCR gives one an idea of where the paraclinoidal ICA is. The paraclinoidal ICA then enters into the distal dural ring and becomes the supraclinoidal segment. So this is actually the ventral perspective of the paraclinoid ICA. The second is this part of the medial preforaminal segment of the optic canal that we've already spoken about, inferior to which lies the optic strut. Now, identification of the medial osea and opening of the dura onto this region allows the surgeon very early access into the cistern onto the lateral aspect of the tumor. It allows for early identification and uh, management of the superior hypophyseal artery during a surgical procedure. So uh, factors that one needs to consider is the lateral extension of the tumor beyond the uh, carotid arteries and the optic nerves the hypothalamic involvement in cases of certain tumors like craniopharyngiomas with the presence of calcification. It is extremely important to identify the optic chiasm before planning the approach and hydrocephalus if present has to be taken care of. Now the tumor goals as far as the broad surgical strategy for any tumor goes does not change irrespective of whether one approaches it from the endonasal corridor or the transnasal corridor. So tumor control, adequate oncological dissection of the tumor with preservation of vision and preservation of endocrine functions is the main uh, baseline that we all aim for. Hypothalamic dysfunction has to be avoided by adequately protecting the hypothalamus and its feeding vessels. And hydrocephalus if present has to be addressed either during the procedure or before the procedure to avoid good outcomes. So um, I think there'll be more correlates that, that I'll speak about when I present my cases. And the first case I'll be talking about is this craniopharyngioma in a 13 year old female uh, who presented with short stature and primary amenorrhea. She also had bitemporal hemianopia on, ex on examination. And uh, this is a large cystic and solid tumor separate from the pituitary gland, which can be seen here, extending into the interpeduncular cistern and onto the third ventricle. So um, this is the initial part of the exposure, which involves drilling of the sphenoid floor. The bone has to be thinned out, blue lined, and then removed. Bleeding from the anterior intercaminous sinus can be managed by packing it with uh, surgiflow. Once the anatomical correlates that I've already spoken about have been identified, the dura can be opened. The case is opened towards the limbus. And then surgical dissection is done using the same microsurgical techniques that we are all trained for from the transcranial perspective. Now cystic tumors collapse a little bit after decompressing them. 
Now, one important correlate that one needs to identify are vessels. The superior hypophyseal artery that will now come into view very shortly is very important for visual outcome in patients who undergo endoscopic endonasal approach. And uh, the superior hypophyseal artery, especially its branches that go on to the chiasm need to be managed very early. So this is the superior hypophyseal artery that has come into view. And this can be gently separated away from the capsule of the tumor. Now, it's important to decompress this tumor adequately before manipulating it. So after the cystic component is removed, we further go on to decompress this tumor using a CUSA. Sharp dissection of these tumor attachments from the base of the chiasm is done. And here, inferior dissection now reveals the PCOM artery, the PCA on the right side, and the pituitary stalk. Another important vessel that will be encountered is the PCOM. And perforators from the PCOM supply the diencephalon and the uh, proximal aspect of the optic chiasm. These also need to be protected and gently removed away from the dissecting uh, field. So once this tumor has been released from its attachments, the CUSA is used for decompressing it. In some cases, the tumor might invade the floor of the third ventricle. And from the endonasal perspective, we are very well placed to identify this area of invasion. In patients where there is obvious invasion, it's probably best identified from the endonasal perspective. And the parts which have infiltrated the base can either be resected by attempting subpile dissection or can be left behind to prevent further hypothalamic injury. So this is the resection bed with the basal, art, the basal bifurcation and the perforators and the floor of the third ventricle all well seen. The repair is performed using durogen fat and then we um, gasket seal a piece of bone before using a large nasoceptral flap for completing this repair. So uh, this is probably the workhorse, workhorse for all skull base repairs. And uh, this is the post-operative uh, outcome with uh, very good surgical dissection and good visual improvement. An MRI done at three months did not show any residual tumor. And at nearly uh, 24 months of follow-up, now this patient remains asymptomatic. So uh, when we compare visual out outcomes for craniopharyngiomas from the microsurgical and the endosurgical perspective, um, one of the cardinal points that we see is that nearly 60 to 80% of patients have visual improvement. And a very small number of patients have visual deterioration when we compare this to the microsurgical uh, series. However, this is offset by a higher rate of nearly 10 to 18% of CSF rhinorrhea. And this is a message to not just be extremely cautious about skull base repair, but to be extremely meticulous regarding skull base repair to prevent CSF rhinorrhea and the long-term outcome. Now, uh, the second important correlate that I'd like to discuss are vascular correlates that are important for um, improvement of vision in the post-operative period. So this is a um, reference from the works of Dr. Uh, Fernandez Miranda from uh, Stanford, who described this branching pattern of the superior hypophyseal artery. It has three distinct divisions which go on to the optic nerve, to the infundibulum, and to the uh, the descending branch, which supplies the diaphragma. The branch of the, the infundibular branch joins its compatriot from the opposite side and forms a network around the pituitary stalk. And it is this branch, the optic branch, which is very important for visual recovery following surgery. So the descending branch can often be divided to mobilize this main trunk and the optic branch away from the field of the tumor and to preserve flow to the optic uh, optic chiasm. And uh, the anastomosis also has to be noted, which supplies the pituitary stalk. So uh, the second anatomical correlate that one has to be sure of is the PCOM, which lies on the lateral wall of the tumor. The PCOM gives perforators, which supplies the diencephalon on the optic tract. And this needs to be safeguarded and gently separated away from the capsule. The third important uh, vascular correlate that we need to know about are thalamoperforators that arise from the basilar bifurcation and supply the diencephalon and the thalamus. 
these lie on the posterior aspect of the capsule and can be damaged if we go through and through the capsule onto the posterior aspect. So this is an important correlate that one must keep in mind when they're dissecting tumors of the floor of the third ventricle. So uh, pituitary adenomas have been classically tumors that have been very amenable to endoscopic endonasal approach. However, the typical pituitary adenoma tends to be extra arachnoidal. And the beauty of the endoscopic endonasal uh, approach for a pituitary adenoma is that the surgical procedure itself does not violate the subarachnoid space. However, in this case that I'm presenting, we have this large pituitary adenoma which perforates the diaphragma and fills the entire third ventricle and causes upstream hydrocephalus. Now, um, this, is, this tumor can be tackled by many trajectories. It can be tackled from a transcranial route, through an interhemispheric approach, or through a tyrional corridor. However, in, um, we thought that we could tackle the entire tumor using the long axis through the endonasal corridor. An EVT was placed at the beginning of the procedure, and then uh, the same surgical steps to delineate the uh, dural boundaries and the margins were then carried out. So there's a part of this tumor prolapsing through the dura. The dura is opened, and the cellar part of the tumor is removed in the same manner that we normally do for all the cellar tumors. This is a soft tumor amenable to suction, and using the by uh, using the two suction method or using the curette and the suction parts of the tumor are removed. Once the cellar part of the tumor has been entirely decompressed, the attention is turned towards the diaphragm. And it is at this point that we notice that there's a small rent in the diaphragm. However, the rest of the diaphragm seems to be intact. So this requires the corridor to be expanded. We first go for a trans-diaphragmatic corridor. However, the corridor appears to be very narrow. So a more anterior exposure is extended the dura is extended, the dural exposure is extended anteriorly, and the ventral aspect of the gland and the inferior surface of the chiasm is identified. Once again, this corridor is gently uh, widened, and the dural opening that we've already performed on the diaphragm is now widened. So now um, this EVD tip that was placed into the ventricle has come into view. And this has obviously been placed too deeply, so we we moved it back a little bit. Once this corridor is widened and uh, a part of the diaphragm is excised, the tumor now can be again decompressed. So part of it is, is decompressed using suction and the wall of, of the third ventricle is then meticulously dissected away from the tumor using the same microsurgical techniques that we use during our transcranial approach. The, the pyre is gently moved away using dissectors. The upper part of the tumor is dissected all the way to the back. And uh, following the dissection of the upper part, our attention is brought down to the inferior aspect. And this is the laminar terminalis, which is related to the inferior part of the tumor. This is also separated by minimal violation of the laminar terminalis. On the other side of this, we will find the basilar artery. So we keep this laminar terminalis as the plane of dissection. Dissection is extended posteriorly till all the attachments to the ventricle are removed and the tumor itself can now be delivered onto the field. So um, this is the ventricular wall and uh, the foramen of Monroe with the choroid plexus that now comes into view. So uh, the reconstruction is done using facial lata, fat, and uh, a large nasocircle flap. So uh, this is the post-operative image which shows good uh, dissection of the tumor and adequate tumor control at the end of nearly uh, nine months of surgery. So having dealt with uh, craniopharyngiomas and uh, an invasive pituitary adenoma, the third very common tumor that's dealt with by this technique is a tuberculum cell meningioma. In this particular case, there is an eccentric distribution towards the right side with optic canal invasion of the right. And this patient had bitemporal hemianopia with uh, poorer vision in the right eye. So uh, this is the surgical approach. Once again, the, in, the dural incision is extended onto the uh, middle aspect of the optic foramen on the left side and also onto the right side to first get 
a very wide exposure of the base of the tumor. This would be very similar to what we would do when we were doing a convexity meningioma uh, to expose the entire base, to devascularize it, and detach it from its dural attachments. The dissection is then performed against the uh, pituitary stalk, which is in view right now. And this is the superior hypophyseal artery on the left side, which is moved away from the capsule of the tumor. Now, uh, the tumor itself is not very large. And the surgical challenge in this is to adequately remove the part which is invading the optic foramen, without which visual improvement would definitely be suboptimal. So once this tumor has been dissected away from the optic chiasm, the tumor is delivered out in the surgical field. This is done after all the arachnoidal attachments have been removed and it has just this stock um, onto the optic chiasm. But now at this point, they realize that the exposure of the, of the optic foramen itself is inadequate and that further bone removal is needed before this particular, this particular part of the tumor can be delivered into the field. So um, after the tumor has been amputated from this part, I go on to drill the optic foramen on the uh, right side. And now the dural attachments of the tumor can again be cut. Now this is the segment which has been described as the preforaminal segment, which lies just proximal to the part of the optic nerve within the true foramen. And in this manner, the uh, tumor invading the middle aspect of the optic canal is removed. So the corridor itself lends itself very well to removing uh, parts of tumor that invade the medial aspect of the optic canal. However, for tumors that invade the lateral aspect of the optic canal or have attachments beyond the lateral aspect of the optic nerve itself, it's probably better to choose the trans cranial corridor and adequately decompose the optic nerve after opening the falciform ligament. So this is the last bit of the tumor which is being uh, removed. The optic chiasm and the other structures are seen very well. And then the repair is carried out using a large nasoceptral flap. So this is the enhancement of the flap. And uh, at two years now, this patient is doing very well without any recurrence. So uh, this is an algorithm which was published by Dr. Schwartz from Cornell. I was very lucky to be a part of this paper. And uh, one of the correlates that they used is the uh, volume of the tumor, which lies anterior to this line, which connects the anterior aspect of the sphenoid sinus and the skull base. So for tumors that have more than 50% of the volume anteriorly, or for tumors that have very large extensions beyond the uh, internal carotid artery or beyond the lamina papracea, or in patients where olfaction is preserved, a transcranial corridor might probably be a better option compared to a transnasal corridor. So uh, these are the classical tumors that we see, the pituitaries, the craniopharyngiomas, and the meningiomas. I'll also present some less common but uh, challenging tumors that might be seen in this region. This is a supracellar epidermoid, almost located entirely in the interpeduncular cistern. And the tumor itself has displaced the optic chiasm and the stalk anteriorly. This makes any approach from the transcranial corridor more challenging and places neural structures at risk of traction. So this patient had bitemporal hemianopia presentation and we've chosen the endoscopic endonasal corridor. And uh, right away, when we open the dura, the tumor then comes into view. So the challenge here is to work both uh, around the stalk of the pituitary gland, as well as to preserve and um, move vessels that are encased by this uh, supracellular epidermoid away from the resection field, while at the same time maximizing it. So this is the superior hypophyseal artery, which is now being dissected away from the uh, epidermoid. The dissection itself has to be done gently using uh, microsurgical techniques without placing undue traction upon uh, these vessels. So um, like we remove them uh, in small piecemeal, uh, 
the tumor itself is decompressed gently. The resection cavity is now extended into the interpeduncular system and onto the floor of the third ventricle. So the attachment against the mammary body and the third ventricle of floor are pretty tenacious and requires some amount of patience to gradually dissect it away. A surgical field of dissection was carried on onto both sides of the uh, pituitary stalk till um, a reasonably good resection margin was achieved with uh, adequate protection of vessels. There's a small bit of tumor which is situated on the uh, oculomotor nerve on this side. So once again, a repair in this case was performed using facial ata, I'm sorry, durogen and a large vascularized nasoceptral flap. This patient did have postoperative aseptic meningitis, which might be seen in these patients with epidermoids. However, the repeat, the uh, lumbar puncture was sterile and had, has no fault. I a follow up of maybe 11 months now without any visual complaints. And this is the postoperative image with the diffusion uh, showing a small capsule bit attached to the brainstem on the left side and a small bit attached onto the third nerve on the right. Um, my penultimate case is of a very unusual tumor, a chiasmal cavernoma in a young 23 year old patient who had presented initially with just right sided visual loss. He had been advised surgery then, but he was lost to follow up for nearly over a, a year. And when he came back to us, he came with uh, worsening visual fields, this time involvement of both the eyes, showing an ongoing process of uh, increase in the size of the tumor. This is a complex mass which is. Uh, hypointense on T1 predominantly, but it has areas of hyperintensity. On T2, there are features of hypointensity suggestive of uh, areas of hemorrhage. And uh, so we still had cavernoma as a differential, but we did have craniopharyngioma as one of the possible options in mind. So this is the exposure that I've talked about. And now we slowly dissect the arachnoid around the tumor to see this um, bulbous yellow black uh, lesion occupying the entire cistern. When we look beneath it, we find the pituitary stalk. And uh, when we look above it, we see the uh, anterior communicating artery complex. So now we're pretty sure that this is a lesion that is located within the chiasm. And uh, it's an ongoing process of bleed within the chiasm that has caused visual dysfunction. So uh, we first open this in the direction of the nerves at the most prominent part that we can see and almost immediately evacuate uh, a certain amount of blood and uh, the lesion itself deflates suddenly. So once we've encountered the lesion on this side, we need more wider exposure. So the, the other prominent part of the uh, cavernoma is inside again along the direction of fibers of the optic chiasm. And we encounter the wall of the tumor itself. So once we've seen the wall, the dissection is performed to remove um, this from the adjacent neural tissue. Small bits are initially taken to first at least achieve some sort of dissection plane against normal neural tissue. We are very aware of the fact that uh, the dissection is happening within the fibers of the optic nerve and might result in further deterioration of this patient following surgery. So once the surgical plane has been obtained, and the plane has been taken beyond uh, the wall of the tumor onto the floor of the third ventricle on the left side. The same plane is developed again on the right. Altered areas of hemorrhage can be identified. And again, using uh, dissection techniques that are familiar to us from the transcranial corridor, the chiasm is entirely separated from the neural tissue. So uh, this is the this is the optic chiasm, the tract, the third ventricle and the uh, pituitary gland. So uh, repair is again performed using fat and durogen with a large nasoceptral flap. So uh, this patient was actually did well with improvement in vision following surgery and at six months continues to show a visual improvement. He had temporal hemianopia on the left side, but almost complete resolution of the uh, visual deficit on the right.
So uh, this brings us to my last case for the day, which is of a craniopharyngeal canal. And um, again, there's a 13 year old female uh, male child who had a history of cleft palate surgery at two years of age and had presented to us with progressively poor vision. And at visual examination had uh, bilateral superior quadrantopia. So this is again a complex mass. This is a bony spur which extends from the floor of the sphenoid all the way into the floor of the third ventricle with a high density, probably fat, located at, at its apex. And the MRI shows a complex mass. Again, there are hypo-intense areas with hyper-intensities uh, and uh, T1 hyper-intensity suggestive of fat here at the apex of the lesion. In the view of progressive uh, visual dysfunction, he had documented quadrantopias in his vision. We decided to remove this lesion. So the initial process involved extensive drilling of the skull base to detach this tumor and minimize manipulation of the optic chiasm. Once we incise the dura, we see that this optic, this bone spur has actually indented and impinged into the optic chiasm. So we're not really surprised at the fact that he had visual deterioration. So this is the optic nerve and the bone is then removed uh, in a manner very similar to what we would do when we do a clinoidectomy. So now the soft tissue part is dissected away from the floor. This is the, uh, the fat attachment, which has to be removed using a CUSA. And then the surgical plane allows us to remove this complex mass. This turned out to be a hematoma composed of uh, cartilage and bone. And then this, this repair was performed using a flap. This patient did have CSF anuria postoperatively. However, uh, he underwent endoscopic endonasal repair of the, uh, of the CSF anuria and continues to do well nearly at two years of follow-up. So uh, there are complications. These procedures are not without their own set of complications. They include cesafrinorrhea, hypopituitarism, diabetes insipidus, hypothalamic injuries, vascular injuries, or visual deterioration. We had one episode of vasospasm on the fourth postoperative day in a patient who had a craniopharyngioma. This was managed using endovascular techniques, endovascular uh, chemical angioplasty with milrinone with complete recovery cognitive and hypothalamic uh, injuries following surgery. So to conclude, uh, the endoscopic endonasal approach is a very suitable approach for a very wide spectrum of lesions. The approach as well as reconstruction must be well planned. Uh, Neuronavigation is a very useful interoperative adjunct with meticulous case selection and detailed assessment of vascular relations, um, which is required prior to the surgical procedure. A vascularized neuroceptile flap is important and decreases the frequency of CSF uh, leaks. Thank you. Very good. Aip? Uh, excellent talk, uh, Prakash. Very good talk. Uh, commenting on this excellent talk. Uh, so we would uh, go on to the next speaker and then uh, we will have questions in the end. Uh, so would uh, um, would Luis want to talk right now? Yes, I'm yes, here. Please, please, please I was trying to ahead. find the form. No. <laughs> okay, okay, Luis, go ahead. Can you listen? Yes, 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 yes. Let's start sharing the screen here. Can you see my my screen? Yes. Oh, right. oh, not oh, yet. No, you I, dropped off. You dropped off. Yeah, 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 yeah. I put the wrong button. Okay, make the screen big. Okay. Now we are on. Yes, perfect. Okay. I was preparing first of all, well, thank you, Professor Shirian, Dr. John Bennett, and a pleasure and an honor to be in front of Professor Yuha one of the giants of the history of the neurosurgery, and Professor Vladimir Benis, one of the greatest neurosurgeons in Europe today and for the history of the neurosurgery. And I was planning to show some case yesterday, I talked with, uh, with the IP, but uh, Let's talk a little bit on one point of meningiomas in the tuberculum cell area that today there is some controversy. 
I don't know if there is a controversy. It's like in the football, you know? There is Messi and there is the other players. I have good players and other players. There is Pelé, there was Pelé, and there are other players. And there is a microsurgery and there are other techniques. They say microsurgery from the nose, they say microsurgery from the hair. The meningioma from the anterior fossa can be in the olfactory groove, can be in the anterior clinoid, going to the cavernous signs or not, can be in the tuberculum cella, can be attached in some area that you don't know. Sometimes you believe that the attachment is more anterior in the attachment is more posterior. Sometimes you believe the attachment is more anterior and you see it's more posterior. It's possible to remove a small meningioma from the, from the nose. Of course it's possible. But is the best way? Everything that's possible is the best. Not everything that's possible to do is the better way to treat some pathology. You can come from the nose, you can expose the anterior fossa, you can expose the area and remove. How you saw very nice by Prof. Dr. Prakash, wonderful, wonderful presentation, very nice videos. It's possible to take meningiomas. It's possible to remove cranial pharyngiomas. It's the best way to treat pituitary adenomas. Maybe the only way to remove midline cordomas. But for intradural lesions, is the correct way? Let's think this way. If you just know to open the cranium, you have no idea how to do the, na the, the nasal surgery, you are a neurosurgeon, you have no training in the nose. Maybe this polypus here, you indicate subfrontal approach. The same way that you are ENT or the, you are certain that you just know how to work from the nose, you believe that the only way to remove this tumor is through the nose. These, these two pathologies are completely different. I don't know if somebody today or one day think to remove this polypo from the cranium. But today they are doing this, they are removing the polypus, the intradurally that is the meningioma through the nose and make a big hole. But the most important than this, they're not doing the total removal. Because we know that the study of meningioma during many, many years, then 90% the of the tumors, the meningiomas, they are the main mass, tumor mass, and small babies around. I call the baby meningiomas. It's a very nice work made by Professor uh, Borovic from Israel. He's from Uruguay. He is, was in Haifa. In, in. He shows that the majority of them, there is some babies. If from the nose you cannot see, if you, if you open the head, for meningioma, you knew that you see very small tumors around that you have to remove. Let me tell you what's wrong with microsurgery for tumor from this area. What's wrong to work in the system? What's wrong to work in the arachnoid? What's wrong to, to dissect safely and gentle the brain? What's wrong with the frontal lateral approach? What's wrong with the cranial approach? 
Or it's better to come from the nose and see there and pull and pray. Because you cannot see the vessel that are behind. Oh, you can mobilize after you see. There is no way to see the tumor behind, the vessel from behind. It's the truth. Transnasal approach, transphenoidal approach with endoscope one is one of the greatest advantage for this tumor, this area. But does not mean you have to say and to use to every case that you see in the head. When I started to study skull base in the early 90s, I think Professor Benny know very well and Professor Yuha, I saw Ibrahim, Ibrahim from Jordan is, is listening us also, and Professor Benet, Benedito Colli from Brazil. The, the whole world was seeing the skull base from the nose, from the, from the ear. They are coming from the ear, doing very large approach to remove yeah, yeah, yeah. fibro. Yeah. The tumor was, there is some microphone that's, that's on. No. Can, can all the delegates mute their audio, please? Can I, can I continue? Yeah. The, that time they're using trans temporal pro to everybody. Now we are in the same era, not in the era of the ear, but we are in the era of the nose. And the people want to see the war through the nose. Skull base surgery, you need to know to go around the skull base. Sometimes you need, sometimes you don't need. And tumor like this, you can come from the nose, of course, but it also can come from the head. Today, they have a very nice way to reconstruct with pericranial, with flap vascularized septum flap, nasal septum flap. Very nice way. The CSF leak is still a problem, but not in the same dimension you have years ago. Now it's okay. Can do it. But possible does not mean better way. You can do for the cranial. That is our entire life. We as a neurosurgeon learn to do craniotomy. You train to do craniotomy, to epidural hematoma, to subdural hematoma, and for tumors and aneurysm. It's our life. Now I'm seeing neurosurgeons from around the world that are afraid to open the head. Open the head, oh, oh. They are not neurosurgeons. They are doing different things. Independent approach to use, the classic opternal approach, the cranial orbital approach, the frontal orbital approach, the frontal lateral approach. It depends. Every surgeon has his tricks and like to use one technique or another technique. But, so, but the idea is the most important, to come intradural lesion, intradural approach. CSF leak is not an issue to us, very small issue, very uncommon. But if you have, you also have a very nice flap, the vascularized pericranial flap, you can just cover the base of the skull. If you need to feel the sinus, you still have the anterior wall of the sinus who can feel and impact the sinus that this pack will be fixed inside the sinus. You don't need to put a ureth urologic uh, uh, canal from the nose. It's the way. Let's see this case here. You come open the system, identify the optic nerve, very gentle. 
identify the olfactory nerve, go where the tumor is coming, cut the vascularization of the tumor, and remove the mass. You can go ahead and remove the dura. If you need, you can go ahead and drill the bone. Simple, our entire life, we did this. During all our career, the entire career is doing this approach. Today you have a case a little bit large and like this, you can do the same. You go to the attachments of the tumor, in the tuberculous cell. Now, if the patient has deficit, severe deficit, uh, vision deficit, I always open the canal and cutting the, the false form ligament. I remove the, uh, I open the canal extra dural and after coming intra dural. And first, before we move the tumor, you open the false form ligament. This way, the optic nerve will be free. Because hours you touch. From the nose, you don't touch because you don't see. You pull. Okay? Here, you see. You touch. You remove. You can take the entire tumor in one piece and save the anatomy of the sea. This is safe. Just traveling through the system. Sometimes we have situation like this one. We have two more, same situation, but the patient has severe deficit, almost blind the right side. In this case, you can do more extensive approach. Sometimes you need, sometimes you don't need, as Professor Yu has said. I prefer to come extra dural. I release the opt nerve totally if the patient has severe deficit. Remove the reclinoid in this situation that there is tumor inside the canal. You can extra dually. Let's go inside, go faster. Open the dura, remove the tumor. The quality is not so good, you see? I don't know what's happening. But you can see all the structure in keeping the arachnoid to the vessels. Same situation. Same situation. Same surgery in every, every case. Watch the trick. Keep the arachnoid to the vessels and to the nerves. This way you can go, decompress the opt nerve, we, we remove the tumor, remove the dura, and safely you can expose and control. And the other thing that is very important, very short instrument, a stable and short instrument. Long instrument are not so stable that you can use short, very short instrument. Is there a tumor in the canal? We can go inside the canal. We can dissect this part inside the canal and you can see the thing. You remove. And the post-op removal. This is, this is a 3D video, you see? The post-op improved the, the vision, not totally, but improve. The people say, oh, if I come from below, can we improve the best? I don't know, maybe, maybe. Another situation, very simple way. What's wrong here? Oh, the spatula is in the brain. Man, look at that. The spatula is in the brain. But look the MRI here, T2. If you open the system, you totally liberate the frontal and the temporal lobe. You just hold the brain, that the brain's coming down. In your post-op MRI, you'll be like this. No damage to the nerve, to, to the brain. And it's exposed out the area. Here's the ophthalmic artery, the carotid artery. 
the optic nerve. You see the point where the nerve was suffering is just in the ligament, false form ligament. In this situation, there was bone invasion. You open his the sphenoid sinus. You can pack with muscle, with the fat or C. The advantage that comes from up that you can feel the whole fat, the whole sinus. See, you can feel the whole sinus there. And the idea when you feel the whole sinus, you have the anterior wall to hold. You can feel the whole sinus there. You can put a lot of fat inside. After you use the pericranial flap, you give some stitch and you close the cavity here. This you can do safely. You do in tumor, you do in trauma, you do in case that you need to do it. And the post op, a nice removal and recovery of the vision. Sometimes we have cases like this. This, pa this patient was going to, they offer them uh, endonasal surgery to decompress, to decompress, decompress surgery for meningioma of the anterior fossa. Imagine the situation. See the tumor like this? You can come from cranial, you remove the tumor, we drill the base of the skull, expose the bilateral optic nerve, you keep the arachnoids to the nerves, you keep the arachnoids to the vessel. This you can drill here, you open the sinus and close the same way. Fill the fat and rotate the pericranial flap and the pre and, and the post of seed surgery. Another situation, the people also offered for this man, this lady, a transnasal surgery. Imagine you are coming from the nose. You see the vessels, you still have an MRI like this one here. The vessel are totally inside. And many, many times, or always, when you do a transcranial approach, and you believe that in the pre-op that the vessels are not inside, when you do the surgery, you see that the vessels are inside, or there is small branches that are come, going to the tumor. See, very big signs. What I did? I came from the thing. I did the situation here, the pre-op, the cranial orbital approach. In this situation, I removed the orbiter, but maybe you don't need. I'm sure you don't need, but sometimes I do a little bit more when you need to drill. You drill, we open the, the, the canal, we remove the anterior clinite. Now we are going under the brain you go to the other side to decompress the other side and keeping the arachnoid to, to the vessel. It's the trick. You see the bone here in the canal, over the canal. See, like in the superior part, you see, see the, the town branch contralateral. And this for me was the trick. You see this picture looks terrible, yeah? Looks terrible, too much blood. But the arachnoid are to the nerves, arachnoid are for the vessel. And to my surprise, this patient had the best recovery as I have. Or almost blind and recovery very, very well. Because in this situation, you kept the arachnoid to the vessels and the arachnoid to the nerves. It's very important in this situation. To the end, we need to know as a skull based surgeons how the approaches from the nose, from the ear, from the back, from the anterior, from the middle, from the high, every kind of approach. And decide the approach that is better to each situation. I am sure 
that in the next year will happen the same situation on the same was happened in the 80s, in the, in the 90s, in the beginning of the 90s. Everybody was open the ear, removing the temporal bone. Big, big approach. When arrived the tumor, impossible to remove. Or was coming from the ear to reach the nose. Now you are coming from the nose to reach the ear. The balance is everything. Everything in neurosurgery, everything in medicine, everything in life. Thank you. Uh, just my, my thoughts about this meningioma of the tuberculum cell and anterior cranial base. Sorry for the long time. Okay. Uh, Luis, excellent talk as usual. Um, now that I've had uh, two very good talks, I guess I must be up to the mark uh, when I'm going to talk. Well, I'm not going to talk too much. I'm going to show our classification, our simple classification of the carotid and uh, how it's related to the skull base. I've been doing this talk for a, a decade or so. Um, but uh, you must understand that both open as well as endoscopic skull base, the main, the main thing that will limit you from doing more is the carotid. So let's get straight into the carotid. So we just put, put it on Facebook. I'm, I'm actually sharing it from Facebook. So uh, this is what John gets uh, very excited about. So I, I'm, I'm actually sharing this from Facebook. So I'm, I'm going to show you the segments of the carotid. And then I'll show you how they're related to skull base structures. And I'm going to do it in less than 10 minutes. Okay. So you will see. That, that segment of the carotid, the ENT or the endoscopic surgeon is called parapharyngeal. That segment of the carotid is called the C7 in our classification, C7. Remember that all the odd numbered segments, so for example, C7, C5, C3, all of them are vertical. This is about our classification, if you want to say something, the main thing about our classification is all odd segments are vertical. So starting from proximal, we're going to have C7 where it enters the petrous bone that's vertical. Then we have the paraclinoid carotid, which is again vertical. So odd numbers, so C7, the next is C5. And then you have C3, the paraclinoid or the paracellar carotid, which is again vertical. So then you have C7, C5, C3. You just, you just join these with horizontal segments and you have the entire carotid in the skull base. It's so easy, you see? So you have C6, that's a Peters carotid. You have C4, that is the horizontal intracavernous carotid. And you have C2, which is, which is your intradural carotid. Now, from an endoscopic as well as for a lateral uh, perspective, one important branch that you see here at the C5, C4 junction is the meningohypophyseal branch. Very important for petroclival tumors, very important for many other things. I mean, we if we had uh, time, we could have shown you how we can clip this artery between the fourth nerve and the V1 for uh, some time, this meningohypophyseal artery can supply a dural AVF. And so in such one of those cases, we have clipped 
this meningo epiphyseal artery between the fourth and the V1. So the fourth and V1, I will show you. I'm going to show you structures now. What is that ligament? That ligament is the petrolingual ligament where the C6 carotid becomes the C5 carotid. So that's a petrolingual ligament. Okay. So now we have some more landmarks. That is the clivals. That's why it's obviously called the paraclival segment. You have the PCP there, the posterior clinoid process. You have the anterior clinoid process there. By the way, this illustration was done by Voralax, and uh, she's one of the most talented uh, illustrators, uh, and she's a consultant neurosurgeon, so and interested in vascular and skull, which is one of the most talented uh, illustrators that we've seen. And it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, we have a few of the, them with us right now. Uh, there's this boy from Africa who's really, really good. And uh, there's one from Moldova who's also uh, doing this. So we need to get this talent and, you know, we need this help to bring information that we have, Louis has, Pragash has to the world to illustrate. This is so important, you know, that's how we can teach. So that's the PCP and the ACP. And so now the nerves are coming into view. So underneath and lateral to the ACP, you have, that is the superior orbital fissure. And you have the third nerve. The fourth nerve will come and actually overtake the third nerve in the superior, superior orbital fissure. That's the third and the fourth nerve. Then you have the V1. V2, V3, and medial to the V1, you have the sixth nerve. And then you have the eustachian tube going parallel, uh, parallel to the C6 carotid laterally, the GSPN nerve going there, becoming the VDN nerve, marking the foramen lacerum. The foramen lacerum is where the C6, C5 junction happens. So uh, that is a uh, super, I mean, the greater superficial petrosal nerve uh, goes there, joins with the LSPN and becomes a VDN nerve there. And it's a marker of the foramen lacerum. And you can see the C7 ascends in front of the cochlea. So that's a cochlea there. So when you're doing a, a Kawase's approach, one of the things that if you completely drill away the cochlea is that you can... Uh, go and enjoy your carotid. As long as you keep your cochlea in a Kawase's approach, um, if you see the cochlea and if you preserve it, there's very high chances that you will you will not do this. You will not damage the C6, 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 C7 junction. Of course, in a Kawase approach, you always decorticate and uh, expose the carotid uh, because you can maximize your lateral approaches. So all this we will be showing. When the Petrus portion comes, we'll be showing all these videos, both cases as well as uh, anatomy videos. So you see, it's so easy. The carotid becomes so easy. C7, horizontal segment. So the C7 horizontal segment, C5 horizontal segment, C6 horizontal segment, I mean, sorry, C3, C5, and C7, odd numbers. They are, I mean, sorry, vertical segments. And then you have the C6 and the C4 horizontal segments. And you have all the structures that are around the carotid in the skull base. And that is anterolateral skull base for you. Now, let us see if you can recognize some of these structures. Let's see. Okay, let's. So what is that segment? That is the C7 segment. That is your C6 segment. That is your C5. That's your infralateral trunk between the fifth and the V1, I mean V1 and the sixth nerve. That's the infralateral segment. That's the infralateral trunk. 
very important sometimes in sphenopetrochlial meningiomas. That's a meningohypophyseal trunk. That's a horizontal intracavernous segment. You have the C3, you have the C2, there are three fourth nerves, there are V1, V2, V3. You have your GSP in there, you have semicircular canals and the cochlea there. Right. So let's see another picture. Now, this looks very complicated right now, very complicated right now, but let's try and identify. So that is your optic now. That's your optic now there. So you have your ophthalmic artery there. And then you have your distal dural ring there. And you have your proximal dural ring there. That is C3. That is C5. And that is C6. This is the C7, the C7, C6 junction. And as we said, the cochlea, this is the cochlea right behind it. That's the cochlea. That is V3, V2, V1. And then you have, what is that now? Third and the fourth now. And that is the, what ligament is that? The petroclinoidal ligament or the Gruber's ligament. So that is the sixth nerve. That is the sixth nerve coming through the Doralus canal, coming medial to V1. It's sometimes very important to remove this uh, ligament and drill this bone in uh, petroclival tumors. And uh, uh, you will see the, the C5 segment and medial to that, you will medial to the this region of the gazillion ganglion, you will have the, I mean, you have the petrolingual ligament. Between V1 and V2, you can see the sphenoid sinus there. And then you can see this nerve running on the C6, that's a GSPN nerve. And at this point, between the V2 and V3, you can see the VDN nerve there. If you drill between the V2 and the V3, you're going to see the VDN nerve there. So you see this such a complex picture becomes so easy for you. You come to the posterior fossa, you're going to see the seventh and eighth, the eighth complex. You're seeing the GSP and nerve, the LSP in there. Uh, and you can see the semicircular canals posteriorly. And so you can see the entire cause of the seventh nerve there, except the mastoid segment. So the middle ear, the middle ear is also open, open here. So you can see the entire carotid. That's a C6 carotid horizontal, C5 vertical, C3 vertical, and C2 there. Right. So excellent. So let's get into one more picture. Now, I'm going to show you a case. You should know a little bit about the carotid here. It's exactly what I want you to uh, see. So supposing you do an anterolateral skull base approach. Yes. So I'm going to show you a paraclinoidal aneurysm. And you should see that once you take off this temporal lobe away, once you take off this temporal lobe away, what you're seeing is the cavernous sinus here. The cavernous sinus, you can see the third, fourth, V1 going into the superior orbital fissure. You have done an axial unlocking. When you've done an axial unlocking, what you're seeing is the cavernous sinus, it's a transcavernous approach. You'll see the V2 there. And once you've taken away this temporal lobe laterally, you got, you got a lot of uh, space there. And you take off this clinoid and take off this optic roof. You get much, much more space there. So whether it's to deal with craniopharyngiomas, whether it's to deal with uh, uh, meningiomas, whether it is to deal with aneurysms of the paraclinoid region, which of which one we're going to show you right now, 
and that will be one single case that we will show you and uh, so that will be you you should remember the classification of the carotid and this approach this approach is one of the most common approaches that every neurosurgeon does just an extension of that approach so you can see the proximal dural ring which is actually the roof of the cavernous sinus and the distal dural ring which needs to be incised in many cases so let's go ahead and let's see this case so is a paraclinoidal aneurysm is a transitional aneurysm so we we're going to you can see that's a frontal lobe that's a temporal lobe you're going to cut the orbital meningeal band and start a sharp dissection there usually with a i like the diamond knife it's very light on your hand i've seen louis using the 11 blade knife which is another uh, good thing that i love i mean it's really sharp very very sharp and you can use new ones each time so that's a dissection that i used to uh preserve the true cavernous membrane and take away the temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus thereby doing an axial unlocking i do my uh, basilatip aneurysms like this we will be talking on the transcavernous approach to the basilar uh, uh, very soon in the wfns anatomy meeting so it's the same approach so i'm what i'm doing is this is a front this is a frontal lobe this is a frontal lobe this is a temporal lobe frontal lobe here temporal lobe here when you are doing this dissection what you are doing is you are opening up between the frontal and the temporal and when you are opening the jewel that you find in the opening that with that is going to obstruct all your approaches is the anterior clinoid processes process and the optic roof when you remove that jewel see that is a jewel okay that's your cavernous sinus so going into the superior orbital fissure so that is your that is your clinoid process so before taking off the clinoid process you're going to dissect your temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus as much as you need you don't need to go posteriorly to the cavazes triangle this is not a petroclavel meningioma so there's no need for that but you use this dissection plane there will be no bleeding at all you don't need to inject anything you don't need to if you use if you keep the the right plane there's not going to be bleeding as louis says it's peeling uh, like the ladies do louis always says peeling you know louis is a ladies man so he keeps saying all this uh, uh, things about peeling and he knows it very well so you know people ask me what what do i drill where is the optic strut and uh, where is the anterior clinoid process limit and all that uh, my thing is uh, i drill all the bone that i see there whatever gives me access i drill all the bone so i don't really worry about where is the strut where is the anterior clinoid process ending so i drill all the bone there so in that region this is the anterolateral corridor and i drill everything the optic nerve is there i know that the optic nerve is there i don't want to get into shallow i mean uh, i mean deep wells so i make everything shallow for that you should take out you should take out all this bone that's the optic nerve so you can see that the optic nerve is there that's a clinoid process that the cavernous sinus is there so you are drilling out this bone right now so you must understand that the aneurysm is right there the aneurysm is in touch it's a ruptured aneurysm and it is touching the clinoid process the only thing that will separate you from uh, that is the dura so you must not uh, go past the dura i mean unless you want a rupture when you are in the extradural plane so i have removed everything except uh, a, a shell of bone and i'm still uh, slowly dissecting further so that i have the entire anterior clinoid process to me to dissect i mean now we are using the 2 mm drill diamond to shave off the 
clinoid completely away from the dura and underneath the dura is our ruptured aneurysm. So the strut will be always between the optic nerve and the carotid. So the strut is between the optic nerve and the carotid. So, and the carotid, lateral to carotid, here is the aneurysm. So we are going to drill off all that carotid. I mean, sorry, drill off all that uh, anterior clinoid process, exhaling it completely, knowing very well that the aneurysm is right there. But believe me, we do all our paraclinoids like this. And uh, if you respect that dura, and if you don't make forceful movements, I mean, if you use the drill like a paintbrush, okay? I mean, I have seen the masters, you, Ha, Louis, Vlad, all these guys, they use, they use no force, you know? They don't probably work out in the gym. So, but they use absolutely no force, okay? So you can see that the drill behaves like a paintbrush. Now you can see the optic now completely exposed. You can see the struts, bone of the strut there, and you can see the clinoid process there. So I am, you know, for a neurosurgeon, feel is important. It's just not seeing, you know, you have to feel it. It's very important to feel it. So that's the optic nerve. That's the optic nerve and that's the strut there. So you have to remove the strut. It's very important, very important. So now you cannot, uh, uh, you can just use the two millimeter only for some more time because you are seeing the dura and the aneurysm is there. So people can help me and tell me that the segment of the carotid down there is C3. There's a cavernous carotid going down there. It's becoming C2 there, proximal and the distal dural ring is going to be in this region. Okay, now I'm using a one millimeter drill. Okay. Because the two millimeter drill is too big now. So I am using a one millimeter drill. Again, using it like a, a paintbrush. And you must understand that the one millimeter drill actually is like a needle. It's just like a needle. It can easily go in if you use any force or something. You see my suction is so big, okay? But so it's the one millimeter drill is like a needle. If it, if it goes inside and touches that aneurysm, uh, we are going to stay for a long time with this case. Okay, and patient is also probably going to stay a long time in the hospital. So we don't want to do that. So again, you see that the that bone is moving. So we are very, very gentle on that. Under very high magnification. So that entire strut, that bone, everything what I see there, right from the optic nerve to the anterior clinoid process, everything is gone. So keep on uh, thinning it out, thinning it out, feel it. And again, if there is a bone, use that one millimeter and gently shave it off. This is a strategy. And now you are seeing the dura there, the dura of the optic nerve. The optic strut is uh, removed there. That's, op that's optic nerve and that's a carotid. When you can see that junction, you're, you have done enough good, good optic strut removal. There is a little bit more flattening that you need to do and you are good. So this aneurysm has displaced the carotid medially. It is a large aneurysm and it's a, it's a transitional aneurysm. And so that is the aneurysm. You will see now, as soon as I open the dura, you will see that. So the optic strut is being, the last bits of optic strut is being removed. Again, thin out and then just breaking it very gently because knowing that that's aneurysm. You will see now you open the dura.
open the dura and right there is an aneurysm. That's the optic nerve. We have exposed the optic nerve. You see on that side, the, he was talking about the limbus. So you see, that's, uh, that is the, that's the fold of dura you see. And you see that's a falsiform ligament. And that is aneurysm. That is aneurysm. If we had not done the clinoid resection, it's a space. We would have been really pressed for space. But now we have so much of space, you see. And so that is your optic nerve. And now you dissect your, ane dissect your arachnoid and you are right on to the aneurysm. So you dissect all that, go to the opposite side because it's ruptured aneurysm. Now I'm using, I'm using a diamond knife to cut the falsiform ligament all the way to the cavernous roof, laterally. I'm coming laterally. I'm going straight first and then coming laterally. I'm using the, the ball hook to take this and then I'll cut the distal dural ring, which is literally attached to this aneurysm. So I can take this opening a little bit more I, as, as long as I want, gives you a lot of space because there is no clinoid there. There is no optic strut there. This is the beauty of skull base work. So I have seen Yuha clipping this without any skull base work, believe me. I mean, I have seen him doing this. I don't know how he does this, but uh, uh, you probably must stay a few years with him to see how he does this. This is a uh, it's not reproducible, but believe me, this is reproducible. Okay, you can see everything now. All the this is the your optic nerve, and then you will see the aneurysm. I mean, this you'll see the carotid there. And I'm just going to put, I mean, I'm put a bayonet and show my boys how, how I intend to clip the aneurysm. The carotid is running parallel here. Okay. And that's aneurysm, projecting laterally. So I am just showing them the carotid. I could have taken a little bit more of this. I usually do generally, but here I was completely, I know where that's the carotid. There is the carotid. That's a C3 carotid. That's a proximal dual ring there. You cut that, you will get into the cavernous sinus. Sometimes you have to do that. There will be a lot of unnecessary bleeding. And uh, so you can see the carotid there. The carotid is there. You can see the carotid. And that is the uh, aneurysm. Beautiful. You can see the swirl of blood within this aneurysm. I am looking for the rupture point. Uh, cannot for that's a, that's a, that's a carotid there. That's a carotid, you can see, and that's the aneurysm. You must uh, not rush. Um, the more you rush, uh, the more of less of a neurosurgeon and more of, a, I mean, I wouldn't say orthopedic or general surgeon because uh, that will be disres disrespecting them. So I would say the more you rush, the less of a surgeon you will become. Okay? Patience is, uh, is a big thing. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to sit and go out there for uh, ages and, uh, you know, irritate everybody from anesthetist to yourself. So that's the carotid beautifully seen, the C3 carotid becoming the C2 carotid. You can see the vertical carotid there and the horizontal carotid and the aneurysm slip. There is a neck still remaining. And I don't have those micro clips. So I put a macro clip like a micro clip. I, I just... Uh, Yes, that is the neck taken. You can see the C3 carotid. That is the that is a C2 carotid. And we are done. So I need to broadcast.
and uh, um, I'm going to ask uh, guys to ask questions. There are panelists here. So Vlad, Ibrahim, um, Vinod, Prakash, uh, Yuha. Yuha, is he around? No, I think is he Yuha just around? left. No, no, he just left. Oh, yeah, it must be crazy time for him. It must be sometime, something like midnight for him. So, yes, um, people can please uh, comment. And uh, also, if there is a, this is a consensus. So, this is a, we, could, we can have a good discussion. Please. No, actually, these were one of the topmost presentations which I recently heard. And what I would like to ask is, see, we have two set of surgeons. One is Dr. Prakash, who is probably the best in endoscopy, and uh, Louis and you are the best in open approach. So what do you expect the upcoming budding neurosin to be? You want them to be like you or like Prakash? Because see, it is very difficult for a surgeon to be 100% to good in endoscopy and open as well. That is virtually impossible. You cannot be like Prakash and Borba and you. That's impossible. So what do you expect the upcoming neurosins to be? Uh, well, Luis will uh, also answer this question. But in my, uh, in my view, I don't believe in doing both. Because if, it, I mean, I always believe in narrow and deep rather than wide and shallow. Wide and shallow, you can do everything. Okay, you can say I uh, remove rectal polyps and I also remove uh, some superficial brain tumors. This is good. But if you want to get into skull base, open skull base, you have to, you, you, you have to really put in a lot of efforts, uh, maybe decade of decade, one decade at least into skull base. And uh, that you have to be in a good center where you have a lot of cases. It's the only way of uh, doing things. Don't ever think that these understandings and everything will come in a day. I mean, even in this era of internet and information, everything, hand getting your hand steady is something different. So Pragash's skill is completely different from my skill. So what I will do is to have Pragash with me rather than trying to learn what Pragash is doing. Or I will try to have Vinod Felix or Narayan Janaki Ram with me if I want endoscopic. I am not going to... Um, I'm not going to do uh, both together. So, of course, uh, I do endoscopy also, but um, I mean, I, it, is, it is not my forte. I would rather, I am a guy who will think open. Always I'll think open. If it's cavernous sinus, I'll think open. If it's uh, anything else, I'll think open. And I know I can do open. So, Prakash or Narayan can, knows that they can do endoscopy. So, uh, budding neurosurgeons, I would tell tell you guys, depending on what view you like. If you like the view from the nose, go from there. Do everything like Paul or uh, Ted Schwartz or uh, Vinod or uh, Prakash. Do everything from there. If you like the view from inside the brain, do everything from there. If you want, if you have a fantastic ENT surgeon, um, ENT surgeon with you, this is the greatest boon you have. Don't try to do everything yourself. This is what my message to you is. Um, I would like to hear Louis' uh, version. If you, Louis would like to learn some endoscopy in this time and uh, do something like uh, Prakash or Paul or something, or Louis would be happy doing uh, legendary work that he does in uh, open. I'm learning. I'm still learning. I, I will be learning forever, I believe. <laughs> it's, it's the way to go. I think the skull based surgeon should know endoscopy, should know open. Of course, in the future, you have some balance. The endoscopic surgery change a lot the skull base. This partnership with ENT is crucial, crucial. You can do endoscopy by yourself, but when you do with the ENT, it's completely different. The way that they see, the way that they hold the, the, the endoscope, the way they prepare is completely different when you do by yourself with the neurosurgeon. 
I think this partnership for endonasal surgery is, is, is very, very important. But I believe that in the future, not so long, now is already going to get the balance. Which, which case should do endonasal? Which case should do open? What's better to do endonasal? What's better to do? For example, pituitary adenoma today is very hair you open the head, very hair. You have several cranial pharyngioma that you can remove from the nose. Depend of the size, depend of the extension, depend of everything. See, if you go to the nose to try to, to remove any area that is more dangerous than to come from up, come from up. If you are going to up to try to remove the tumor that's coming out to the nose, it's crazy. You need this balance in everything. Balance is the most important thing. And learn, learn all the skull base approaches. I do by myself the temporal bone. I learned to do the, the petrosectomy. But if you have a nice ENT, you want to work together, do the petrosectomy, it's great. You save your time to the microsurgery. See? But they need to have the same thinking, the same way to thinking in the best for the patient, not the approach that I know, the approach that the patient need. This is the most important thing, the most important thing. Together, but open mind, not looking like this. Yeah. Open mind, you see, sometimes through here, sometimes through here, sometimes through here, sometimes through here. Sometimes you don't need surgery. For example, uh, meningioma of the cavernous sinus today that is more located in the cavernous sinus. We know today that the natural history sometimes is, is, is better than to do anything. See, to understand the pathology, to understand the disease, to understand the best way to treat it is sometimes you need radio surgery. Sometimes you need embolization. See, in life, in medicine, open mind is the best thing that you can get. It's the way they think. <laughs> yeah, it's a per yes. perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, Professor Luis Barba, can I ask you one question? See, if you have very large meningium and olfactory fossa, there are some neurosurgeons who advocate doing it endoscopic and the debulking the tumor. So that the edema around the brain decreases and that makes, that makes your open surgery far easier. I don't know if you got my point. If you debug the tumor endoscopically, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. the brain edema decreases and there's a better plane to dissect during the open approach. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You can come from, from the cranium. It's different to do the surgery when you open the cranium put one spatula here, one spatula there to see the tumor. But what if there is a lot of tumor edema? Yeah, you are coming from below. You kill the tumor, you cut the vascularization, see? The edema is venous edema. What I'm seeing, the people is going from below, does the, the compress. I don't remember to see some case that the edema totally disappear. And the plane will be difficult. In... Yesterday, I did a very large olfactory group meningioma. Very large olfactory group. The edema was there. But the, vet... the problem was not the edema by itself. The problem was some vessel was inside the tumor. See? I think if you can go down. Yes, yeah. you go down and cut the vascularization of the tumor. Other trick for olfactory group meningioma, that the patient, there is no bone, severe bone invasion. I go intradural and cut the vascularization intradural. If you go extradural, bleed a lot. See? But it's just the same. 
a cut vascularization and just work in the tumor without spatula, without leave the brain alone. I don't, I don't understand this. I never saw a post-op MRI from the nose. If you had, you show me, please. <laughs> a post-op MRI that you decompress from the nose, the tumor is still there and the edema disappear. If the edema disappear, it's good. I never Thank saw. You. Maybe maybe it's a good idea. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Prakash, uh, there's one there's one question to Prakash. See, Prakash, if you I have seen that in the in epidermal tumors, when you do that epidermal through the nose, there's a more chance of getting meningitis than when you do it open. Is that so, or what do you believe? Because there are some surgeons who completely stop doing epidermal through the nose. So uh, in this particular case that I had presented, the uh, CSF which I had done at both times was actually spirited. It did not grow anything, but he had symptoms of uh, meningitis, which was probably chemical meningitis. Mm. Technically, when we look at the clinical scenario, uh, it doesn't seem as if um, the epidermoid itself would be very different from uh, a craniopharyngioma as far as the surgical section cavity or the behavior to the, uh, to the field goes. I do not think that epidermoids have uh, any different uh, difference in terms of behavior following an invasive procedure. However, I would like to add one more thing. Uh, in this particular case, the epidermoid had a very peculiar location, which was the interpedunculus cistern. And that was the reason for choosing uh, the endoscopic corridor. If it were an, an epidermoid of the interhemispheric fissure or uh, a case where the skull base was entirely intact, I would probably have done it through a different corridor, probably through a transcranial corridor. So um, I'm not very certain about whether epidermoids have a greater preponderance to meningitis. Uh, and I personally feel that the choice of the corridor must be uh, dictated by the anatomical location and the nature of the tumor rather than a didactic, uh, a dogmatic uh, technique based uh, decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, there are some questions uh, from the delegates. Are the panelists okay to take the questions? Hello. Dr. Nahar, you have a question? Yeah, there are yeah, some yeah, questions. Yeah. There are some questions from the yeah. panelists. Uh, no, from the delegates. May I read them out? The first yes, question yes. is actually uh, pituitary adenoma with supracellular extension with an hourglass deformity with an anterior and retrocellular extension. Do you still feel endoscopic is the best approach? There is a question from Dr. Harshad Parikh. Maybe Prakash should answer it. Prakash? So, um, see, the uh, pituitary adenoma is essentially an extra arachnoidal tumor. It lies within the dura of the cella, but it is essentially extra arachnoidal. So, uh, we'll first take a scenario where the tumor is extra arachnoidal completely without any breach of the diaphragma in the sense that there are no nubbins or there are no extensions beyond the smooth uh, surface of the diaphragma. In those cases, the endonasal corridor continues to be a very good approach. The exposure needs to be wide. And in our case, we expose very widely. We go from uh, cavernous sinus to cavernous sinus. We unroof the entire cell up and we take off the bone over the uh, uh, tuberculum if, re if required. And uh, the exposure always helps us get the extension of the tumor on the lateral aspect. So we can okay. dissect the tumor off the diaphragma. We can come to the edge of the uh, diaphragma and then further take our take the uh, surgical procedure on to the uh, part of the tumor which is suppressed. The second well, well Prakash, when do, when do you say that this tumor is not ideal for an endoscopic approach? When do you say this pituitary adenoma is not good for an endoscopic? What are the scenarios? Laterally, into the, uh, cavern, into the sylvian fissure. So those are tumors that are not accessible through the endonasal corridor. And whenever we've had those scenarios where you've had large tumors within the uh, sylvian fissure, uh, we definitely prefer to come in from the uh, uh, tyrional transylvian corridor first 
and then deal with whatever is left behind in a second setting uh, later on. But for tumors which essentially respect the midline uh, and either extend into the ventricle or even into the subarachnoid space. So we have a set of tumors which are intraarachnoid. They violate the diaphragm, they violate the arachnoid and are located in the intra arachnoidal, subarachnoidal space. So they come in direct contact with neurovascular structures. They come in direct contact with the carotid artery, uh, the oculomotor nerve and the chiasm. And even in those cases, they can be treated in the same manner that we manage for tumors by going extra arachnoidal, opening the diaphragm, opening the dura of the tuberculum and coming anteriorly. But uh, in those cases, the dissection of the tumor from the perforators and from the main vessels must be very meticulous. And those are also patients who might have a greater incidence of having visual decline following surgery. But for patients who have lateral extension of the cavernous sinus, definitely they are not very good candidates for the endonasal corridor. They probably would do better from a transnasal corridor. The okay. second situation is patients who have tumors extending into the parapedicular space. So cavernous sinus tumors that go through the pedomotor triangle and go into the parapedicular space on the lateral aspect of the membrane. Uh, there are techniques described for approaching them through the endonasal corridor, but they lie, uh, they have a high risk of third nerve palsy. Those tumors also probably are better approached through a transcranial corridor. Okay, uh, coming to the next, thank you, Pragash. Coming to the next question. Um, uh, this is a question from Dr. Pablo Villanau. Talking about aneurysms, what is your opinion about going for endovascular so for some particular anatomic ana regions? Maybe it's to Dr. Aipcharyan. When do you want to opt for an endovascular option aneurysm? Uh, well, uh, in my case, almost never. Uh, because uh, I think we can handle at this stage of uh, my career. Uh, I think I am okay handling um, aneurysms in an open way. Of course, there are difficult aneurysms. There are extremely difficult aneurysms. There are aneurysms which are almost impossible to do. But with a bypass, uh, you should be able to handle most of these aneurysms. Now, um, I mean, if anybody is trained, so for example, Shabarish is dual trained, so he would go for a basilar um, in a, you know, in a, he would not operate on a basilar, maybe he would go for an endo endovascular approach. So it depends on people and depends on the facilities. Right now, for the last 13 years, I've been working in a place where there was no endovascular facility at all. And uh, for me, I would always, around the mill aneurysms, um, paraclinoid, basilar, uh, anything, I would not go uh, endovascular. I would rather be very happy flipping them uh, open. Um, I have, can I comment on that? Um, uh, I think, I think it is. Yeah, 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 please. I, I think it is important to be able to do every aneurysm open and endovascular, either you or you and your partner. Um, and uh, select what you have to do for your patients. There are some cases where it's better done endovascular, it's better done open. But then if it can be done by both ways, I think it's important to give the patient the choice and tell them what is the advantages and disadvantages of each and let them choose what they want for themselves. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, basilar to paneurisms, I would say, you know, I always tell the patients we can do an open operation, we can do an endoscopic, we can do it endovascular. I tell them, frankly, you know, clip is one and done. There's no chance of any recurrence. It comes with some comorbidities like cranial comorbidities, but they recover, right? But on the other hand, if you do it endovascular, there's a chance of the aneurysm coming back. You need to be on aspirin, plavix. You need retreatments. You need to come back again and again to check the aneurysm. So it's really what the patients want. And you should be able to do uh, both well if they choose to do either. Uh, well, uh, Shabarish, uh, it's actually very nice to see you after the college. He's my senior in Madhuri Medical College. Thank nice you. to see you, sir. May I say something? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, say it's, something? it's a hi to Dr. Shabarish. He's my senior in medical college. So it's hi to him. So, uh, and there is the next question is, when do you do a simultaneous approach, both open and endoscopic together? 
there is a question by one of the delegate can somebody take no, the Lewis question say, oh, so, sorry 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 Lewis. Yeah. okay about the pituitary adenoma i always start from the nose i will start from the nose because the great majority of the time is is midline okay and sometimes go high in the transnasal for pituitary you never know how much you can remove sometimes you go there and believe that you can take everything you cannot sometimes there is area that you believe that you cannot reach you can you follow the tumor sometimes the tumor the great majority of the time the tumor give you the root you can follow the tumor but when the tumor is too lateral Larter to the ICA in the cavernous sinus or going out to the uh, oculomotor triangle, maybe it's not so safe to come from the nose. But who, who say that it's possible, it's not possible, is the time. Pituitary is different. For cranial pharyngiomas, if there is a large cella, I start from the nose always and try to remove the maximum that I can. Sometimes you have to come from the nose. You cannot remove. You come from the head. I did a case last, last month that I came from the nose. I removed, but not too much. I came back from, from up. In the same operation time, my partner came from the nose to put back the 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 fascia, the, the fascia, no, the, the, the nasoceptal flap. See, nose, head, nose, head and nose in the same time to hold the flap. It's, it's important to understand that you need to have all the armamentarium in your, in, in your hands and decide case by case. This uh, water that is closed, how you saw, call the, the, looks like you cannot remove the superior part, you see? Sometimes you find a hole in the tumor camp. It's case by case you need to decide. The other thing about endovascular, the bone endovascular is here to stay. There are cases that they can do very well, there can they, they cannot do very well, you cannot happen as you go fighting against endovascular for some case. Sometimes you need endovascular, sometimes you don't need. It's the great majority of the time, the best treatment is to clip and done. But if there is some situation that you cannot. See, everything in life, is balancing. <laughs> Louis, okay. one more thing, you know, I think it's important for neurosurgeons to do endovascular. It's extremely important because if you think about it, if an interventional person who doesn't clip, does an angiogram on an aneurysm, they are going to try to treat it by whatever method they can, okay? And they're not going to refer the patient to a neurosurgeon saying that this is better for a clip. So if we have to preserve um, the skill set among neurosurgeons, it's extremely important that neurosurgeons learn angiography and are able to treat these aneurysms. And we do a, a balanced decision and are not biased to one or the other so that we do the best thing for the patients. It's the most important, you know, in, in, in Brazil, I think in the whole Latin America, 70 to 80% of the endovascular, neuroendovascular are made by neurosurgeons and is growing very, very fast, see? But the radio surgery, 70% or more are made by radiation therapists not by neurosurgeon, not, not participate. In this field, you, you need to, to be on also in the radiosurgery business. I think 
is a neurosurgical business. Endovascular is neurosurgical business. You have to be involved in these two subspecialities. And, and, and it's also important to be not biased because there are microsurgeons who go and learn endovascular who still prefer to do an, a microsurgery. There are neurosurgeons who just do endovascular training, do not do complex vascular or skull-based training, and they just treat everything endovascular. It's, it's important to have the expertise to do both equally and do it well, uh, rather than be biased towards one or the other. But this is the most difficult one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, Ip, are you there? Are you there, Ip? Or Vernad, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm very well here. I'm, I'm actually, I was listening to all these excellent comments and what do you call? These are pieces of gold, words of wisdom. <laughs> I have. So, I have uh, Prakash, um, uh, have you tried doing superior hypophyseal aneurysms through the nose? You know, you're able to dissect so well the superior hypophyseal arteries. Maybe you can get proximal control. Uh, is that something that is in the horizon? Is that something that is doable? Why don't more people do that? Uh, so, you know, there's, there is some recent literature with uh, approaches for either the paraclinoid IC aneurysms or for the superior hypophyseal aneurysms. And uh, there are three important things that I think are uh, Step, uh, you know, roadblocks. The first thing is that you need adequate instrumentation. You need the long shafted uh, clip applicators, and you can't use the routine uh, clips that have horizontal blades. You need the side biting clips to actually clip these aneurysms. They have you, you have your conventional uh, clip that opens wide and then closes. You're uh, you never be able to get around the aneurysm. So most of the people who do use clips use these side biting clips. So they are not. You need the shafted applicators. And uh, the second thing is that uh, you, you have to skeletonize the paraclival carotid artery and then open the cavernous sinus dura to first achieve proximal control. The, uh, so these are limitations from the surgical perspective. Personally, uh, you know, my, the focus of my work, the bulk of my work is essentially skull-based surgery, both open and, and uh, uh, into this, uh, I am. I have a very small uh, role in overall scheme of um, managing any museums that I have. So, I mean, it's technically feasible, but uh, you need a person who has a focus in that area to go out and do it. But these limits have to be overcome before somebody decides to start doing it. Have a comment? Can I share this? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, your uh, nice presentation, Professor Yip and uh, Professor Borba. Uh, and uh, I really, I was uh, very uh, surprised by such a discussion between the two theories of uh, microneural surgery with the minimal invasive. Actually, there is a main point what I feel it during my practice that. The, when you uh, use the endonasal uh, approach for minimal invasive, you see uh, the pathology. But when you use uh, the micro neurosurgery, you see and control. And the, to control is very important in, uh, in, 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 in the uh, risks uh, of the operations. Uh, we can take off the tumor from down, but the, the, the operation actually, it's not just taking the tumor. We are opening the cisterns. We are dissecting the arachnoid. Uh, in the subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, we are treating the uh, vascular spasm. This cannot be done from below. So this is the philosophy of microneurosurgery. Uh, when you open the Sylvian fissure and you, you see the vessels of the uh, circular uh, of Willis, you control it before you take the tumor out. But when you are working from down, you are taking the tumor, and then after that, you will see the normal structure. Let's make, and this will put this 
a structure in high risk. Uh, I cannot imagine that if, if you have a tear in that carotid from ca how, how, you, how can or how, and how risky you can repair it from uh, uh, down, it will be very uh, dangerous for the, the patient. So the main point that you can see from below, but the, the microneurosurgery and the health of the patient, you should see and control what you see. This is a philosophy. When the, oh, we're opening the cistern and we are relaxing the, bra the brain, we are treating with the, with the pathology. We are relaxing the brain. We are uh, giving uh, positive uh, uh, points to the, to the, to the brain and the, to the patients. And this cannot be done from below. So this is uh, uh, what I want to say for you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I want to uh, respond to that particular part. So there are three things that you mentioned. The first is about being able to take control of vasculature. So one of the basic concepts of the intranasal corridor is that you encounter the tumor first, rather than having to dissect through structures to come to the tumor. Now, one of the uh, causes for morbidity when you come from the transcranial corridor is that you dissect across the corridor of nerves. For example, when you come into the interpeduncular system, you dissect across the third nerve. And some of these approaches do lend to a certain degree of third nerve balance. Or if you dissect the sylvian fissure, you have to go through a certain degree of uh, veins, which may also be morbidity. So obviously, the outcomes change from uh, hand to hand and from case to case. But it is not a scenario where the other corridor does not have problems. And it is not a case where uh, the endonasal corridor ha only has problems. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that early decompression of the tumor, early dissection and decompression of the tumor actually facilitates uh, dissection of structures that are related to the wall of the tumor. Because the tumor itself has now collapsed and the arachnoid planes are more prominent and they can be separated very gently. So that's the second thing. The third thing is that in terms of releasing CSF, uh, CSS spaces are open when we open the supracellular cistern or uh, the interpeduncular cistern for endonasal procedures. So, contribute to a certain degree of brain relaxation. But uh, for patients who have, say, have hydrocephalus, for instance, the case I presented, you always have the option of inserting an EVD at the beginning of the procedure. The EVD can be retained for three to four days, and you can remove them either electively or if you cannot resolve hydrocephalus, you might need to manage the patient with the VP shunt. That again is not dictated by the approach, but by the uh, manner in which the CSS spaces respond to the pre existing hydrocephalus. So uh, I think uh, it, the, the choice of your corridor is dictated by the lie of the tumor, by the pathology, and also by the technical expertise that one has in dealing with these, rather than being very dogmatic about choosing one corridor over the other. Well, uh, Dr. Borba, Dr. Ibe, you have something to comment on this? Uh, Borba? I don't know. I, I agree with, with Jalal. <laughs> I agree with Dr. Jalal. I think it's, you can dissect from the nose. You can do nice dissection. But it's not the same that microsurgery, short instruments, dissect the insulin. I think your hands are not so stable. Maybe you are, sometimes you take too much risk that you don't need. It's, it's my opinion. <laughs> what about, you, what about you can go for the cranial. <laughs> You agree, Dr. Aip, or you have some different opinion? Uh, well, I agree. I mean, I, I think what uh, exactly what Luis uh, uh, said. I mean, obviously, I have done both. I have done endoscopic as well as uh, open uh, microneural surgery. And uh, definitely, definitely, I am not going to go into uh, aneurysms for endoscopic because it's a narrow corridor. Uh, 
your hands, uh, you know, it's probably because we are not used to it. Actually, that's why I said uh, the skill sets are different. So maybe I mean, when I complain, it's it's not true that maybe a guy like uh, Juan or uh, Ted Schwartz or uh, somebody like uh, Paul, they may find it much more easier. But for me, in that narrow corridor dissection with long instruments, is always difficult because. I'm I'm not very good at that. So for me, always open uh, with short instruments, as uh, what uh, Louis said. I I completely agree. Okay. So uh, if there is no other comments from uh, any delegates, would each of you like to give one last closing comment? Can I probably start from Dr. Pragash? Last closing comment from you. So uh, I think uh, I say the same thing that I started started by saying in the beginning, and that is that I almost completely agree with Dr. Lewis and uh, Dr. Dalal, and that uh, neurosurgery neurosurgery is a uh, is a is a matter of a large number of techniques, and uh, the endonasal technique is just one technique in the armamentarium of the neurosurgeon. Uh, this, this is complementary to the uh, transcranial microsurgical technique because not uh, doesn't contradict the transcranial technique. Instead, it's complementary, and uh, the surgeon should uh, be well versed in both to be able to choose the right corridor, as dictated by the uh, anatomy of the tumor, the anatomy of the neurovascular structures, and the pathology. Thank you, Thank you Pragasha. Any closing remarks and last comments from Professor Borba? I would like to thank you for the, the time. It was very nice, very friendly dissection. I really enjoy and learn a lot with all of you. IP children, our mentor, a great man, Professor Prakashi, and wonderful presentations. See you next week. Next week it could be cavernous sinus. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's cavernous yes, yeah. sinus. It'll be a big fight in the. That'll be a, <laughs> it, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. No problem. No problem. Okay. Thank you very, very much. See you next week. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Borba. Uh, thank you, Pragash. And I, sir, please your last closing remarks and and uh, what about you need to get a closing remark from Dr. John also. Yeah. John Bennett. The neurosurgery is changing. So the microscope will soon be replaced. We are working um, very hard on that. Not only will the microscope uh, replace, the navigation and the microscope will become one and the exoscope will be integrated with that. This is what we are working on, okay? An exoscope, endoscope, and with navigation. So virtual vision, real vision, and endoscopy together. This is what we are working on. And we call it the hyperscope. The, the chapter is out. The prototype is, uh, we're trying to get it ready in India because uh, every time we're trying to get it outside, the costs are just skyrocketing. So we're trying to get it that This is why I'm leaving my job and coming to India. So things are going to change. Okay, new tools are coming. So you don't have a, uh, you, you will not have single instruments like a suction. You will have suction with bipolar, suction with irrigation and bipolar. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, CUSA, mechanical CUSAs with maybe, uh, with maybe coagulation, plasma knife with uh, CUSA. So combined instruments, visual, uh, different, I mean, difference in visualization, it's going to change neurosurgery forever. So gone are the times, these primitive times are going to go and then we will not have to sit and uh, fight on these things. We will have to sit and fight on many different things. So neurosurgery is going to change. And it's really exciting times ahead, you see. Okay. And uh, actually, it's, uh, I would like to thank uh, Aib Sir, Dr. Pragash, Dr. Professor Luis Borba, and all the delegates and above all, Dr. John Bennett for arranging this wonderful webinar. There's so much of information. And I would like to also place a request to Dr. Ipchen that we must publish this work in the Ignite Journal sometime if possible. We are, region. we are doing it. We are doing it. For sure. And probably I should it. also congratulate Dr. Voralex because a lot of comments in the chat section, how did Voralex do this illustration? So a special mention 
special thanks to her too and yeah she is amazing don't forget don't forget the next sunday the same same time we are having kavarna sinus and the speakers are juan fernandez mirenda luis borba and ait charian so please don't miss that and on 6 september we are having peter sapex endoscopic and open paul garner luis borba and ait charian so please note down all these dates on your calendar and don't forget to attend all these webinars so thank you once again sir thank you hey, thanks and everybody you. for coming and we'll see you next week thank you john thank you john thank you luis thank you vinod prakash thank you thank, thank you everybody, everybody bye bye thank you john thank you for this thank you, you for coming it was wonderful excellent much. congratulations